me. He's basically carrying me, and I'm sitting on the back. I could just see Donnie and Rousseau sitting down the bottom. <laughs> and we and Donnie is a huge man. He was 124 kgs, and I was on the back of Henry, going over Donnie, and then over another <laughs> couple of eggs, <laughs> riding, riding off the back of him. Hello, and welcome to the Rugby Pass Off Flavor, Ryan Wilson. And this week, we are joined by our other co-host and great friend of the show, the one and only Freddie Burns. Uh, and if that's not good enough, later on, we've got an incredible treat for you all. Uh, we'll be joined by former RLB Player of the Year, World Cup winner and all-round uh, Springbok legend, Skalk Berger. However, before we get into all that, Burnsy, welcome back on the pub. How's it all going? Thanks for me back. I can't remember too much about the last time we spoke, but... Um... Yeah, it's always uh, it's always a pleasure to come on and have a little chin wag with you boys on a Monday afternoon or whatever it is. So you, but you're you're a bit dusty today, yeah? Yeah, I had a few. Obviously, you know what it's like. You get we played Saturday, we played Quins on Sunday this week, so you get the the long the long week. Um, so what I try to do is, mate, generally I, I try not to drink too much during like like the normal turnarounds. But as soon as I get that eight day turnaround, I went out for dinner with my missus and. Chris Ashton, his missus, and a couple of other friends and got on the red wine, which I've not done for a while, mate. Um, obviously, adding to that, losing at home for the first time in a while, uh, it was kind of drink the drink the pain away. Um, yeah, and it just it just catches up, you know. I'm, I'm 32. I can't, I cannot drink and be all right for like, it takes about two days. So the thing is, I come back with the missus, we end up carrying on drinking here for a bit, um, which is never good. I, end, I cooked a gusto meal. I use that gusto meal. It's like three in the morning. I'm cooking. I cook a full meal. <laughs> I cooked a tomato and and feta cheese linguine, mate. At about three o'clock in the morning. <laughs> Bit more red wine, that. Honestly, mate, it was yeah. I don't know. But I just yeah. It's it's, it's fucked in it. Uh, it's good for the soul, though, mate. It's good for the soul. Never yeah. stop. Never stop. So, Fred, last time you were on here, obviously you dropped that, mate. Yeah. You know, Amazing drop goal, man of the king of Leicester. Bit of a turnaround since then. First home defeat in 490 days. You're sitting at the table. Uh, how tough has this season been so far in comparison? Um, I don't think it's been any less tough. I just feel like, you know, for the first time in a while, we've we've fallen the wrong side of the results. And the last couple of weeks, the performance hasn't been um, where we wanted it. And, and that's the that's a disappointing thing for us, is we're actually a team that they generally just focus on the performance. There'll be times when you play well and you end up on the wrong side. Um, and we don't feel like the last two weeks we've given, you know, that, that fair account of ourselves. Um, you know, that said, it ain't crisis times, mate. Like we've, you know, we've had a, a tough start to the season. We lost to a very good sale team at the weekend that, all right, again, it's not skewing over the fact that we need to be a lot better. But, you know, the important thing is, is that we, we bounce back and, and just start performing well because, You've seen the results in the Premiership this year in particular. Like they're all over the shop, mate. Like no one's, everyone's going to be beating everyone at some stage. So as much as we need to change some stuff, not as much as we need to get better at some stuff, and that's what we always go after. In terms of it being panic stations, I think as champions, you, you lose two games and suddenly everyone's going, Jesus, like the wheels are falling off and it's literally yeah. going to be further from the truth. I saw someone tweet the other day, someone tweeted me the other day saying that, um, that, uh, Winning the league came too quickly for this group, and you're like, you're like, oh, fucking. What, what, what are you chatting about? Like, honestly, I had to fight with everything not to just be like, you absolute twat. <laughs> you know what I mean? But like, you just, it just, it, that's the thing, and 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 that's another thing as well. Probably this year, we've got to get used to having that tag as as champions now. And last year, we we snuck up on a few teams, and people didn't expect us to be, you know, as good as we were. Um, and now everyone knows what's coming and, and everyone's, you know, we're the team that everyone wants to see fail now. So there's a bit of that getting used to it, but no, I fully believe in what we're doing and, and how we're going about the game. And I'm sure a, a few more weeks together and stuff like that, we'll, um, we'll keep getting better and hopefully pick up some more results. Freddie, one of the biggest superstars in the world, Andre Pollard, just a few minutes on his debut before getting off injured last week. Was that your voodoo doll? <laughs> no mate no to be honest with you like he's come in like class bloke like super professional got his head down obviously worked hard to get back from from that injury um and then when he come on against Saris, i thought he made an impact straight away um so i'm yeah gutted for him to pick up a 
another injury. Hopefully it's not too long. I actually don't know the ins and outs of it, but you know, he's, he's a class bloke and he's great to have in the environment. And he's the kind of guy that we, we need back fit um, and, and, and in our team. So uh, he's been a great addition, even though he's not played that much. Um, right. <laughs> But no, he is honestly. He's he's been he's a he's a good bloke. So it's um yeah. I don't know what else to say, Matt. I just want yeah, 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 yeah. Want no, to say no, no, very political, very political. Yeah, it's good, yeah. It is. You know, you want players like that, but it's good. Good to get a little run, and you're happy to be in there. What's he driving? I actually don't. I think his missus dropped him off in like a little Merc. I think. Oh really? I've not actually seen him drive, mate. I've offered him a lift a couple of times, but he's like, no, the missus is coming to get me. No, I'm like, oh. Okay, okay. Bye-bye. Thanks, Jeremy. Interesting. I wonder why he doesn't drive. I think he does, mate. I just, I don't, um, maybe they've just got one car at the minute. He's probably waiting for Range Rover to build him one or something. Do you know well, what I mean? I, yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Like, he's, yeah. got, he's got to have some whip on the moon. Right. right. And Sorry. now we are delighted to be joined <laughs> by a Springbok legend, the most capped South African flanker of all time, World Cup winner, Scout Berger. Uh, Scout, welcome on the show. How's it all going over in SA? Thanks, boys. It's all going well, yeah. I mean, we don't have load shedding currently in Cape Town. Nationally, we're on stage two, so there's power, there's light. And us down in Cape Town, summer is arriving, so the days are getting longer. Uh, for the boys traveling from north, it will be excruciating soon. You know, we'll be touching 30, mid-30s to close to 40s, especially if you go up country, but it's all good down in Cape Town. Scout, you're obviously keeping your, your, your eye on it as well, but this involves all three. Leinster with that big win against the Sharks, really entertaining game. Johnny Sexton's been getting some shit about it uh, for his interactions, if you will, his exchanges with the ref, Craig Evans. Uh, yeah. Ryan, we know you're, you're not partic- you, you You've had your, your back and forth with, it, with him in the past. Both of you, have, well, all three of you have played against him. Is he one of the whiniest players you've ever played against? Yeah, I, re- I reckon he's right up top on the uh, on the list. Um, and this is not the first time. I think he did the same in the in the semi final against the Bulls. Um, I think the the ref handled it quite well. But I think you know the convener of the referees, Tapa Henning, ex South African, he's got some extra work to do. I mean, he's got to basically put out a rating for Johnny Sexton and his refereeing performance on the weekend. Um, uh, it's it's just a little bit too much. The referees are are there to do a job, and I look, all of us try and influence them as best we can. Um, and if you get there, and I think there's a way to do it, do about it. It says, listen, listen, yeah, for the instant where Baird got knocked, knocked out, have a look, ref. And if the ref says, no, he's had a look at it, he's happy, just give him a compliment. Says, well done. Even if you don't agree, um, you don't have to make a mass- massive scene about it. And and I, and I guess he gets away with it. Um, but I, I think people's patience will run out with it. And, you know, it's actually going to be a negative effect on, on the Leinster side because they played phenomenal rugby. It was actually such a good game. And the Sharks ran them so close for 60 minutes. And then um, straight after that, you know, they um, they sort of just, you know, it was a little bit of a drop-off from their side, but also just game management, a couple of big moments, because it was pretty much a score each, you know, like Lancer would score, the Sharks will come back. And as soon as the Sharks fell two scores behind, I think they felt under heaps of pressure to chase the game, which they had to. And uh, Leinster put them away. It was an amazing performance by them. And I mean, same with Johnny. Johnny was incredible. You know, that, that a couple of cross kicks. Ring Rose came off the bench and I think he, he combined to make a thousand running meters in the game. So uh, it was incredible watch. You, you do think, though, it, at some point, the refs can get so pissed off of him that they'll start pinging him because, and it does sometimes turn the ref. You've, I've seen it happen so many times. The boys are harping on the ref, and the refs just get fed up with it. Some of his teammates, you worry, you, you think they'd be like, just shut up, man, just shut yeah. up. But he, he, we'll see, we'll see. I guess the referee was super calm, but right in the end, when Ruan Janssen van Rensburg rightly so got the red card for the high shot, I mean, he just kept on going on about it. And the ref was listening, I've got it under control. I mean, he's going to get a red card. He can't get more than a red card. I mean, Ryan Janssen from Rainsworth ran off, jogged the Leinster player, said, sorry, mate, I gave you a high shot. We don't need the added drama. I mean, there's, I think there's enough drama on a game as it is. We, we battle to keep, you know, 15 players on the, on the pitch at, at best of time. So we, we, didn't, we don't need the extra whingy. It's always the nines and tens, though, isn't it? Yeah. Look, I mean, I don't think I've got the cleanest cut record when it comes to speaking to referees or, or, or opponents. But I mean, there's a point where you know, you've got to back down. I, I think I think we we're in such a precarious position where it's almost a watershed moment because 
obviously we we had the whole Nick White debacle where gamesmanship went to a next level. Um, you know, Fuff the clerk touched his moustache, you know, displaced one hair and he went down, basically knocked himself up, whinged about it, and you know, Fuff got a yellow card. But I think, you know, rugby doesn't stand for that. You know, we are not football where gamesmanship is part of how you draw free kicks out of other players. And I think it's up to all of us to look at our teammates going, get up. That is, that's not worth it. Um, and I think we, it, rugby is, is a game with a lot of integrity and respect. And, and we have to have that integrity and respect with the referees and our fellow players because it's a bloody dangerous game. And we go at it 100 million miles an hour and, and there's massive hits and other people you introduce to rugby can't believe what we put our bodies through. But I think we're going to lose a lot of what we've built up over the last 150 years if all of a sudden gamesmanship starts to become something. Because often you see a good hit and the head clash happens after that. So I put a era, I mean, last weekend there was a couple of instances where it's just a good solid hit and then two players' heads hit each other. That's completely an accident. But if there's gamesmanship within that, the one player is getting a red card and the game for us as spectators and pundits alike gets, you know, gets destroyed because it's never nice watching one side, you know, losing a player. And I, and I think, you know, for us, you know, rugby is trying to find out where we fit in, in world rugby and, and, and the world sport. You know, how attractive can we make this game? And I think on the weekend there was games that was phenomenal. But I think we just got to stop with the, the gamesmanship bullshit because I think all of us are, are are sort of getting, you know, enough from it. And, and our game is stop-start at the moment. And we want to see more ball and play. But you watch the game and it's, you know, it's 140-odd you know, minutes and it's 28 minutes ball and play, which, you know, it should go the other way. It should be a shorter game, more ball and play. I mean, ju just quickly, f finishing off on, on all of that, Scout said Sexton probably is the whiniest player that he's come up against. Freddie, who who would you say? Uh, I'm not sure. I don't really. I, I don't pay, I'm, probably, I'm probably the whiniest myself. You know what I mean? <laughs> I'm screaming touch when someone runs at me trying to get them to go down. <laughs> what about Farrell? What about Owen Farrell? Uh, he likes to get into the ref. I, I, re I reckon Fez is, you know, he's also up there. Um, I played he's with got, Fez. He's definitely got better with it. I think he's got smarter yeah. with it. I, I played with Fez heaps, but I think he's matured a hell of a lot. I think 10 years ago, all of us thought, geez, I would like a piece of that. Um, but then, you know, we I grew to know him and he's, I think he's, he's got a good balance now. Um, but I, I look, I mean, all of us are super competitive and I guess that's where it stems from. He's so competitive. You want the best for your team. You want to get a result. And, and I guess sometimes you just overstep that boundary, you know, um, whether that's in a physical capacity or is, if it's with the lip like um, Johnny. Uh, I think Faz has got a lot better. Um, he goes hard as his teammates, uh, especially in training. Um, and oh. sometimes, uh, uh, and sometimes I reckon some of us South African, um, you know, we don't, we don't quite tolerate that. You know, we started chasing him around, <laughs> even if even if he's playing as our number ten. But um, I think Faz has got a balance there. But like I think, you know, with Sexton, I think it will improve. Nick White's up there too. Um, I remember Storm was playing the Brumbies and I chased him around for 80 minutes at the old Newlands and uh, you know, didn't get a hold of him enough, but I got him a couple of times. Well, um, I've heard a few things about Faz going off at a few boys at training. Jim, uh, Jim told me he got it pretty tight at Sarri's. Big Jim oh. Hamilton off of Faz and also Petrus Duplessis Para. He said, yeah. he said he was relentless with him. Yeah, the problem with Petrus Duplessis is like he takes you out in your attacking shape. So yeah, you, you'd be running a line and he's the basically your guy tackling you from behind while he's trying to, I don't know, be a support runner or a tip option or whatever the case might be. Look, Jim in the beginning took it quite personally and then later on it was just, Jim, you shit. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, get, get out of your way. You take your line outs and complain that we've got to stop them all or you know, set up a all try and... Um, Jim, I mean, whenever I got there, we Tuesday was our big day at Saracens and we'll have live mauling in the morning and then we'll have a full-on high-intensity session in the afternoon. And he was sitting just across the corridor from where I was sitting. And um, I just used to go, thought, if I thought, gee, because I, I don't know if I've got another season in me, I just walked across and looked at Jim. <laughs> and then I realised I've got a lot more seasons in me. He was done. Eh? He was done that last year. <laughs> He's paying for it now. You should see the nick of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just looks like a coat hanger. There's nothing to him anymore. You you were always destined to, to play rugby. Right? I mean, following the, the footsteps of, of your father, who's also a Springbok, of course. Uh, right, I'm going to butcher how it's pronounced, as, as we've heard. Uh, you went to the famous Par yeah. Gymnasium? 
Yeah, that's fine. In Afrikaans is a pedal gymnasium. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> don't worry, boys. Stick to English. That's fine. Oh, he won't, he won't yeah. get to the French. He goes all hee haw, hee haw, hee haw. He gets out of guns. He's fucked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but you, okay, but uh, Skarky, thank you for that, right? Skarky yeah. played. Uh, uh, well, John de Villiers was also at the same school. Did you did you boys play together? Yeah, he was a couple of years ahead of me, believe it or not. I look a little bit older, but we played cricket together for the first team, and it's actually I think our, our best sporting achievement ever. Is we had an opening stand of two hundred. Um, for Paul Jim, first team cricket, me and John. Um, I was more the traditional batsman, believe it or not, and he was the pinch hitter. He was a wicket keeper, uh, hardly a batsman, and then he wasn't making runs at number seven, so we just plonked him in the top of the order and somehow made like 80 or 60 or whatever he did. But you were actually better at cricket initially, is that right? So I finished with a cr cricket contract um, in my first year and then, you know, was playing rugby on the sly and the next moment I knew I was um, playing rugby. Yeah, so I did a quick 360 like midway through my first year. How's the carcass holding up now after all those years of playing rugby? Do you regret the decision? Uh, you got uh, the cricket uh, route? Uh, look, I mean, I, I, when IPL came across, I was like, what the hell am I doing running around for, for 80 minutes smashing each other? And it's not only that you, you boys know, it's not only playing, it's the training that takes it out of you almost more. Um, but I'm actually all right. Like, no running. My motto post rugby was no pain, no pain. Um, and, and I went for like a 6 k jog when I came back to South Africa with my missus and I was like, my left knee hurts, cheers, and I got on the mountain bike. So to keep, to keep the beer belly away, I fly up and down the mountain bike um, two or three times, uh, two, two or three times a, a week. And I'm, look, I'm going up, I'm slow, but coming down, I'm charging. So I'm still getting my, my weekly dose of adrenaline, which is good. Um, and I've got a little beer next to me. So, you know, I went on the mountain bike this morning, so I feel like I have to have a beer at night. You made your debut in 2003 for the Springboks. What are your memories of that incredible day? Um, it was at the SFS, the old one, not the revamped one. Uh, we played against Georgia. And the, the biggest thing was, you know, you just want to go. I was on the bench uh, and I wanted to come on. Uh, and I was meant to come on just after halftime. So you're obviously like just chomping at the bit. You want to have your first cap. And then just before, like basically when they put the cards up, okay, you know, Number 19, you're going on for number six. Our number six got a yellow card. So then I had to sit on the side for another 10 minutes. I had to sit there. I eventually got on the field. And then, you know, you're nervous at first until you make your first tackle or carry. And then it's just, it's just rugby. I mean, you, you don't really think about the, the next. It goes too fast to your first game. You hardly have a recollection. I, I got, we got a left hand scrum and the box, box scrum was dominant. And then our number nine was kind enough. To say, listen, Escala, this is your pick up and pick up a go and flop over the try line. So it's called a it's called a try and debut. But 03 wasn't our proudest moment. I, and I had to endure quite a few uh, horrific preseason camps. Um, we went to the Camp Stalgrad and we did a, a, a training uh, training camp up in George, which I don't know how we all survived that. But now after that, the good thing about being exposed about that first 2003 World Cup is we we knew how not to do it, um, which sometimes in life is, uh, is is quite a nice thing to have. Was it weird you've lined up a few times with with John de Villiers? Like, is it weird that you you guys literally knew each other since you were kids, and then you're out here at like the the, the pinnacle of your careers as well? Yeah, it, it it was amazing. So John was a couple of years ahead of me at school, and then in 2002, um, I bumped up, so I started playing for the under 21s, and we got to S under 21s, um, and John was obviously now. You know, we were best mates, but he's a couple of years older, and we we managed to win the junior junior World Cup in Joburg at Ellis Park. Uh, we did Australia in the uh, in in the semi, and then we did uh, sorry New Zealand in the semi, Australia in the final, um, and that was our first taste of like doing something big together. And then we went back and played some Western Province under twenty one stuff, and the next moment we were playing for the box together. So. You know, we were roommates from, we can remember, from I was 16 and, or 14 and he was 16 um, in the cricket sides. Um, so, I mean, I, I mean, I think the our wives are only catching up now. I think me and John has actually spent more time together in a room than we have with our better halves, unfortunately. I mean, just quickly touching on the, on the school, so what, what are your memories of the intensity of schoolboy rugby over in South Africa? <laughs> Yeah, so we obviously in down in Western Cape, we've got an amazing league because we've got we come from Paul, which is a small little school, but they've got three big rugby schools within that town. Well, they've got Paul Jim and Paul Boys, and they've got Boland Lampasco, which is an agricultural school just down the road. At 25 minutes from there, Stellenbosch with Paul Roos, with the, the 1,400 boys, very powerful, it's called Brett's old school. 
Um, and then you've got the guys who's, you know, hours drive down the N1 or N2 respectively. And then you've got all the Cape Town school, Bishops, Weinberg, Sachs, Ronnebosch. Um, so our league is so competitive. Um, and, and we play in the biggest schoolboy derby in the world, Paul Jim versus Paul Boys. 20,000 people turn out to watch it. It's a festival of sport the entire week from cricket to hockey to whatever is going, uh, golf. Um, it's incredible. And then obviously your top four sides, then the under 15 A's, 16 A's, the second side, the 19 B's and 19 A's, we played at, at a neutral venue in the center of town. And who, who, everyone who's been to that, you know, we've got like yellow and red and, and green, or yellow, maroon and green, and, and boys are as white and blue and light blue. But the town's split in half. So straight in the middle of the town, you've got your Paul Jim side and you've got your Paul Boy side. And when you get to the stadium, there's 20,000 people and it's exactly like that. The one half is Paul Jim and the one half is boys. Are. So for, for a week in Paul, the town's split in half. Same for you boys as well. For your, Do you remember your schoolboy days? It's sort of the same, yeah? I played, I played one game. I played one game for Beach and Cliff first team when I was in year 11, right? When I was in year 11. <laughs> and I reckon, I reckon 80 people watched it. And I felt like I was a king because my tutor group was allowed out to watch me during the <laughs> thing, right? And I literally felt like a king, right? So much, yeah. completely off topic, so much so. I was telling the story of my actually, so much so. I actually got invited to the sit form disco that night as a year 11, right? So I went, I know, take this guess worse. Play like, a player. Honestly, I'm, there thinking, I'm, you, I'm thinking I'm, I'm like the king, like swanning about, like obviously two years younger than everyone played against, I don't know, some shit school, right? Like, literally, the quality of rugby would have been fucking terrible, right? We had uh, Norwegian exchange students would come over for, like, a, a turn and ended up... Well, well, I ended up kissing one, right? So I kissed this girl. I'm 15, I'm 15 years old, can I say? So I'm 15 years old. I kissed this girl, right? Going to school the next day, and I, you know me, I'm giving it big licks to all the boys about kissing a Norwegian. Like, oh, no. Next, you know, I'm walking down the corridor with about eight of my mates. Who's walking towards me? The girl I kissed, right? So as she gets about five metres where I say hello, and she just blanks me, shakes her head and walks past. Fucking <laughs> ripped me. I've never been so wounded and crushed. I was sitting on fucking cloud nine to literally just be in like... Uh, yeah. Imagine that. Imagine how you felt after playing in front of 80 people. Imagine what these boys feel like. That's what I mean. It's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah, we didn't we didn't play much rugby. We didn't even have a rugby team. I remember they tried to start up a rugby team, and I was the coach. <laughs> yeah, it didn't go very well. Just ended up and everyone trying to fight each other, and that was it. Done. Yeah, on another note, though, what a bloke John De Villiers is, eh? Like, what, yeah. he was at Tigers. He was at Tigers for a short period. Yeah, just in here, and like rocked up and just lovely bloke. He was struggling with his knees at the time, and I think he went yeah. to scan. He went and got a scan on his knee and, and the, the um, surgeon come back and was like, literally, we have no clue what is old, <laughs> what is what? new, what's what. And it was just like, just see how you feel. But honestly, in terms of his, like, I must have been 25, 26. Like, this bloke come in, he's obviously a legend of rugby, unbelievable player. But like, what, what a bloke. Just he made such an impact in such a sport, short space of time at Tigers, man. I just thought, fuck, that bloke is just... He's... he's a He's a, he's a top, top man. He does it wherever he goes. But, I mean, he must have been the highest player per minute. I mean, he did two games and did his knee. And then, apparently, like, all the training he was did was, like, jogging around the field. And he did two yeah. laps and it would blow up again. I was like, John, what are you doing in the Midlands, boy? And he's like, no, I, I don't actually sure what I'm doing here. But um, he came to visit me and then actually took the train up to you guys and went to say hi to a lot of the coaches and, and players that was there. So... The top, top man. We obviously played together for ages. We were based down in Cape Town. We were privileged to, to play here for a long, long time. So, um, no, he's a proper man. Also, the difference between him just pitching up morning, having a coffee with you, and two beers down the line is completely different. I've never seen a man's tongue get so loose after two beers. Yeah, he's, I, I, he's class. A, a short story on him, right, which for me, right, sums him up as a bloke, is we played... Um, Champions Cup semi-final against Racing at the Nottingham Forest Stadium. And I did my syndesmosis. I was on crutches. And as I was crutching out, he came with me. My brother was there. And he introduced himself to my brother. Like, that was it, you know, like and like most, most boys would. And a couple of weeks later, um, I was at a game. 
And uh, my brother was there again, and I was doing corporate or something. And I said, I spoke to Master, don't think what? He goes, yeah, you never guess what? He goes, what? He goes, I was walking to my seat and someone tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, hey, Jack, how are you doing? And he said, it was John de Villiers. Now, obviously, my brother's like a big rugby fan, but just for yeah. a bloke to, like, introduce yeah. himself in passing, but then still, like, remember and almost go out of his way to say, like, my brother, yeah. I couldn't believe it. He literally was like, I'm walking to my seat in the stadium and I get a tap on the shoulder. And it's an absolute legend who also remembers my name. And I just think that just for me has always summed him up as like what a top bloke he is. Because a lot of people go, oh, yeah, you're right, mate. And then fucking forget the name, not really bother about it. But he really cared about people. And I thought that was just, um, yeah, a great story for me about, about Sean. Speaking of that horrific injury that he obviously had at, uh, had at Leicester, I mean, you had one in 2006 against Scotland, Scott. Yep. At the time, looked possibly career-threatening. How, how actually close did it get to, to the career being over? Um, yeah, six, probably not that bad. A big neck injury. So the neck fusion, I was young, I was 23 at a neck fusion. Obviously, we came out the blocks playing a certain style where pretty much every collision, it felt like I had to win. It doesn't matter who it was or what it was or if I was compromised. You know, after that, after the neck fusion, you had to adapt your style a little bit. Like you're still physical when you can be, but you can't try and be, you're not invincible. Um, and you realize that quite quickly in your rugby career as you get older. Um, look, obviously, if we look back now, we I played heaps of rugby, but then every four or five years, I did something big. I had a big one, so I had a big neck injury, a neck fusion in 06. And then, you know, come uh, 2012, straight after the 11 World Cup, I had a big knee. And then I had, you know, the big you know, cyst on my spine, which was a bit of a scare, which nearly took me out in, in 2013. Um, and then you know, bounced back after that to to play a fair few games still after that. And then finished it at Saracen's actually ripping my hamstring tendon off its attachment, which was, um, it was uh, pretty much me and Marcello Bosch, um, you know, scoring some uh, penalty slots straight after the game of the soccer ball. And I, I ripped the hamstring off the, off the tendon. But, you know, like when you're a young rugby player, like you take risks and the more risk you take, the better you play. Um, and those risks, sometimes you look back at them now, were nuts, you know, and, um, you know, when you get these injuries, I think it's a good time for you to sit back and reflect where you're at. And I quite enjoyed, you know, coming back and trying to change the way you game because you've got to adapt your game as you go along. You can't just do the same thing over a period of, I played from 02 to 2019 or 17 years. So, you know, players change, you play in different sides, the style of the game plays. You know, we even played in those horrible ELVs. You guys in the North never had the displeasure of playing under them where everything was just a short time. <laughs> you know, we ended up just kicking it and chasing it for a year around here in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, but yeah, I mean, they definitely change your outlook on where you're at as a, as a person, first of all, and then as a rugby player. Obviously, we mentioned that fearing your career was over in 2006. You then, you said the operation on your spine in 2013 and the, the cyst was discovered next to your spinal mm. cord. But then didn't you, you picked up a bacterial infection yes. in hospital where there were fears for, for your life? I mean, take us through that. Yeah, I was just uh, super unlucky. So it, it started in 2012. So we finished the Rugby World Cup in 11. I went on our, our summer holiday, which we don't have now anymore, but like a December holiday and came back and then started doing some preseason games. And first game of the season against the Hurricanes pretty much took me out for the, did a big left knee as we, uh, most of us do. Um, and then came back in 2013 preseason, and I was starting running around. And then my left leg just felt a bit weird. Eh? Sometimes it will be like a groin pain. Sometimes it will be, you know, I'm pulling a calf, or I will get these like weird shooting pains down it. So went for a scan on my back, and they actually discovered that I had a massive cyst that was, you know, compressing two thirds of my spinal cord. And we had to do something about it because the next step would be, you know, loss of bladder function or maybe getting paralyzed on the left leg. Um, so in the first operation was the exploratory operation. They, they stuck a uh, camera through my stomach and one through the back. Had a little look around. And the good news out of that operation was that what have happened somewhere in my career, um, you know, if, if this is your spinal cord and the, and the glass is the membrane that keeps it all together, it's called the deer. I actually ruptured it. And so spinal fluid, or in this case, beer, was flowing out and filling the system, pushing back, you know, compressing two-thirds of my spinal cord. The bad news out of that operation was that I picked up a hospital bug, you know, bacterial infection. And then from there, it spread straight into my spinal fluid and now I had bacterial meningitis. Um, unfortunately for me, normally, like, you, they treat it within two or three days. I was just not responding to the more normal antibiotics. Um, so six days later, 
after four days, they phoned my, my wife and said, listen, you're coming. He might survive this. He might not, but he probably won't be the same. He will have some scarring, whether that's being paralyzed, memory loss, blind, whatever the case might be. So after six days, they got me on the right medication, popped open my eyes, and my wife says, bar some selective hearing, which I'm very, very glad I picked up. The rest of it was all fine. So um, that was the first half of that operation. So that was the life threatening part done. But then I still had the cyst was still there that was going to paralyze me. So then another further four operations, they tried to remove it, couldn't remove it. So they basically just deflated it. So if you look at a scan now, it's still there right next to my spinal cord, but it just looks like a balloon that's been popped. So went in at 110 kilograms um, in hospital for four months, came out at 90. Um, and then somehow, I don't know how the hell I did it, but then decided, no, I actually want to play a bit more rugby. Uh, <laughs> that was a whole, whole different process. So basically played one game in 2012, and then the next game was right at the back end of 2013, playing Curry Cup, and then actually got uh, selected to play for the Barbarians. And that was actually like a bit of a turning point where I, I got a start, because before that, I was just sort of hopping off the bench, the little cameo appearances. Obviously, it was... Um, it was hard. It was a hard, long road back. But that's, I mean, that's a different story for a different night. And um, yeah, played that Barbarians game and then sort of reset some goals and said, listen, okay, let's try and get back in the box setup, which I did in 2014. Well, speaking of sort of that, the rehab, getting back and successful surgeries, you, you managed to do all of that to get into the 2007 World Cup squad in yeah. France. A very memorable campaign, I'm sure, of course, ending up champions of the world. What are your memories, though, about um, some good bumping with uh, Henry Tuilagi? Yeah, yeah no, that is, to this day, I think probably the most scary thing I've ever seen on a rugby field. Um, I remember Jacques Free coming to me and Victor Matfield and saying, look, listen, yeah, there's this bloke, Henry Tuilagi. He's absolutely massive. I've just seen him. He weighs like 130 kilograms. He's you know, six foot two. He's like, but he's, he's the biggest thing I've ever seen. So me and Victor, we're standing like World Cups, you sort of line up and then you you walk out past, in our case, the trophy was there. We, we're playing at the, the old uh, Parc de France and we're walking out and Victor taps me from, uh, we as South Africans line up one, two, you know, 23. So one, two, three, four. Victor looks back at me, taps me, he says, no, he's not that big. And for some reason, the Simone line was a bit quicker. And as they were working, it was the, the tiny little brother. It was Alessana walking out. <laughs> and then and all, all I could see is Victor just panicking. You know, you see his little, he's got his crumpet on. He's just looking back at oh, where the hell is this number eight? And it was, about, it was probably about 10 or 15 minutes into this game. Uh, they, it's halfway. It's a, it's a short, shortened line at five, man. And I'm standing at the back. It was Donnie or so me. And we used to defend like up and in a fair bit of the box. So we, we line up wide. But like this was a ridiculous because I looked to the right and Butch James was like almost on the on the fifteen on the on the other, on the opposite side of the field and he looked at me and he's like that's not mine. There's there's absolutely <laughs> no there's no chance, and and it's the first time I've ever seen like Henry Tuilagi starting like midway between the twenty two and and their own try line and he was the lineup trigger. So when he got to full pace, this other side of twenty two, the ball came. Oh. And the next, the next moment, there was a gap for him to run through. And I, uh, I hope to God that he was running past Butchie. But he just sort of looked at me and he was coming straight at me. So I actually put a, a decent shot at him, like from the side. And then as I swung around and I was now like basically riding up, like on the back of him, he's basically carrying me and I'm sitting on the back. I could just see Donnie Rousseau sitting down the bottom. <laughs> and, we, and Donnie is a huge man. He was 124 kgs. And I was on the back of Henry going over Donnie and then over another <laughs> couple of eggs, <laughs> riding, riding off the back of him. Um, it, it was just amazing. And we, we, I remember having a few beers afterwards and uh, all of us, all of us sitting there and, um, and Austin Run sitting, he, he, he's, he's on brandy. I was on a few beers and he's like, Guys, um, you know, this is my last bit of my career now. I'm just going to retire after the World Cup. He said, but never in my life have I been honest enough to say to a coach I was scared. But if someone asked me after 20 minutes today if I'm scared, I would have said yes. <laughs> it, was a fright, it was a frightening sight. Yeah. Scout, you worked on Dirty Jones in that successful 2007 campaign. We've heard some incredibly odd stories mm -hmm. about his management style and, and personality. Uh, from various people who've been on the pod, what what's your weirdest recollection of him? Um, actually, our recollection with Eddie was quite good. You know, he came on as an assistant, um, 
and he was quite freed up. He was quite relaxed. Like you know, any World Cup is hard on a coach. So Jake White was pretty stressed, as you can imagine, because uh, there was massive expectation on our team. And, you know, in South Africa, we, we tend to get rid of coaches post World Cups, even if they win it, which was the case in, in Jake White. So I think, you know, he knows his tenure was coming to an end. And you know, credit to Jake, like you, he got the biggest personality in world rugby and then Eddie. Um, and sort of just let Eddie do his thing. And Eddie was sort of you know, giving us some subtlety on attack, something we've, we've lacked in the South Africans, I guess we can always work on. Um, you know, just get a bit of a better shape around certain ball carriers with a bit of skill. So I actually worked with him lovely there. But like Eddie, our, our, our relationship was pretty much forged around the bar. So after every afternoon session, I used to pull into, we're staying in, uh, in, in Durban in the city. And I used to pull into the, um, to the bar just to, you know, set my equilibrium straight, have a couple of beers and then you know, go to my room. And Eddie at the stage was also enjoying a few drinks. So every every afternoon, straight after training, we will, you know, one day will be on me, one day will be on Eddie. And then you know, after a while, we became pretty good friends. And then off, after that, you know, the weirdest story was after 15 World Cup, you know, he was appointed as director of rugby of uh, Stormers. And, uh, you know, I had one afternoon in Cape Town, I thought I'll spend it with my mates. Eddie phoned me up and said, mate, come for a, for, for a lunch. Went for lunch, had a few beers. Eddie, at that stage, um, had no beers. Um, but then I spent my one afternoon in Cape Town. Yeah, flew all the way to Japan, got on my Japanese phone. And after a while, you know, switch on your South African phone and about a million messages comes through. And then the first message was, Eddie Jones, sorry, mate, I'm going to coach England. I mean, I wasted one whole bloody afternoon in Cape Town with Eddie Jones. How are we going to fix the Stormers? And off he pissed off to go coach England. You had to forget your fellow Springboks. Can you put together your greatest back row of all time? Well, it's so, it's so hard to do this because you play against so many good ones. Um, and and, and you, a lot of them South African, obviously. Um, you played with or against... Um, but I, I guess the guys that yeah, I sort of formed my career against um, is the guys that I remember as the best players. Um, and, and I don't think it's because it's probably because I was still learning, but also because they were really on the top of their game. And, and you're the best in South Africa, but you go play against Richie McCaw and a Crusaders jersey in crash. It's nine o'clock at night and you realize, holy cow, I've got to get better at, at certain parts of my game. And then you, you hop across the pond and you play in Canberra against the Brumbies um, and then you play against George Smith and you think, okay, this is a completely different ball game. You know, how natural does the game come to this bloke? He sort of works half as, half as much as you, but like his output is immense. And then we came down to Cape Town and we played the Hurricanes and they at the time had a loose trio of Christmas Soe, Rodney Soe, Hollow and Jerry Collins. Oh. And I was so I was the one bloke flying around from the Stormers. We weren't shabby ourselves, but like it was just brutal. And um, I remember, you know, going targeting Jerry and sort of giving it to him. And then he caught the ball in the back and then sort of ran around looking for me, scanning, spotted me, and then just came straight to me. And I realized, okay, from then on, whenever I get the ball and I don't run him, it's actually just going to be a bit of a failure or a rollover. So, so we started this massive physical burst that obviously carried on to the test matches. Um, so, yeah, those three guys, I would say, uh, in my formative years, international player and a, and a super rugby player, was just, it was such a privilege to play against them. But also, I think the reason why we improved so quickly um, is that you get exposure at a young age to play against Richie McCaw in a Crusader side that's dominant or, you know, George in a, in a Brumby side that's, you know, so dominant at that stage too. And then you play against the Harry Kane, so that this natural beast, you know, you play against those three guys as a, as a 20-year-old, you know, you, you better be up for it because if you're not, you're just going to get bullied. Jerry Collins, he was like lead, wasn't he? When, he yeah. when you even try and hit him, just nothing, just whack and just wouldn't move. Oh, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was also just before, you know, they really picked up that he had this little short swinging arm. So he used to knock Oaks out for, for free. Nathan Sharp did one. Colin Chavez just went to bed. So... I watched those ones and I thought, there's no ways I'm putting my head down. Yeah, I'm just charging straight up. My elbows out like this. You know, tackle me where you want to. And even nowadays, it's you know, straight red for all of us. But back then, it was amazing fun to watch and be a part of. And if you watch the replay, you think, what the hell were you on? You know, how the hell? Even on the Sunday morning, you go like, 
why did you do that? Why did you just charge straight at the bloke? I mean, he's the biggest hit in, in, in world rugby, and you, you're just trying to run over him, flipping for 80 minutes, you know. But uh, that, that was the way we went. McCaw, George Smith, Jerry Collins, Ramasari yeah. on the bench. Bloody hell. No Wilson. <laughs> well, well, look, guys, I mean, obviously I said in my formative years here, I didn't get to the later, later stage of my career. But, yeah, I, I, I guess, you know, you know, like when you're a youngster and you, someone leaves a, a real impression on the way they play, I think that's, that's when um, you, you sort of you, you immediately elevate him and he's there. And it, it was an amazing experience to play against those top players. And uh, I wasn't much younger than them. I was a couple of years younger than them. But, you know, they, by the time I came along, they were already, you know, well entrusted with a, a number seven spot in the national sides. Are you the same age as Bismarck? I'm a year older than Bismarck, actually. Yeah. So 39, turning 40 next year. Can you believe that he's still going like? It's next level, eh? He still looks up for it, eh? Um, so, um, no, he's in incredible shape. Um, and also a guy like who's had a fair bit of injuries over the years, but he just seems to bounce back. And, and his brother, Yanni, only finished last year as well. He was 40 when he finished or 39 when he's finished. So, I mean, the Duplessis brothers, I mean, they own a farm and clearly farming's not going well at the moment. They, they don't want to give it up, but they just keep on playing rugby. <laughs> oh, man. I just, I, incredible. It is incredible. You, you did accuse him of giving you a pop to the to the eye. Yeah, I think that I think that could have been him. I'm I'm trying <laughs> to work out whether that was him or not. Someone invited me, and I'm pretty sure. I think- I, I'm, I'm I'm sure it won't come out this week, but by next week it's safe. Hey, next week he'll probably send you a little WhatsApp. Sorry, that was me. Yeah, I don't know. I called him old once, and it didn't go down well. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> he ran over our scrum the next one who's fucking old now man <laughs> <laughs> oh, all the props of my team yeah. like Wilson you wanker what did you do yeah, you yeah. Him up. <laughs> yeah. and, he, and, and did he get it in English or did he did it in Afrikaans so it's a surprise oh, if it no. comes out in English yeah. he, gave, he gave me he gave me it back in English although my Afrikaans is getting better with all the South yeah. Africans we've got over here now no there's plenty of them eh? yeah yeah, what's the Edinburgh, the, 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 the Edinburgh side? Just you know, they've got two complete front rows. That's South Africa. Yeah, they have. Yeah, big VP now. Yeah, I, I hope I hope Oli Cable is not teaching any Afrikaans. He's terrible. Uh, he doesn't oh, understand yeah. Afrikaans. When I when I used to tell Afrikaans jokes, I had to translate it in English for Oli Cable. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he's absolute chock in Afrikaans. He took us to a nice uh, wine uh, a vineyard when we were over there. I asked him what it was called earlier. Grand Don Du Don. I'm Look, Oli has right. has always been a man who um, does enjoy the finer things in life. So oh, I'm no doubt. I, I, I've, I've got no doubt that you guys were treated very well. And he can put a bottle of wine away as well. No, that's a gift he's got. Uh, we we uh, at the Stormers, we always have quite a laid back um, environment. And uh, yeah, me and Oli live just down the road. Yeah, I live uh, in the southern suburbs, Claremont, and he had an apartment just down the road. And every afternoon at four or five, I got a little. What's that, Scala? Where are you? What are you doing? Where are we sitting today? And then we just had to you know, rotate our pubs weekly because otherwise, you know, if you spend two days in the same pub, you know, there's two bunch of blokes starting to chat and saying, like, the reason why the storm has lost is because Scott was in, you know, Forries twice this week. You know? like, but if you go Forries, Barristers, Hudson's, you know, it's a bit harder to track us down. Scott, before, before we go, we, there's, there's obviously an incident in your career that was, that was a big deal here. Uh, in 2009, I mean, what, we've heard what, from what, other guests. I, I, hap- I mean, yeah, what happened in 2009? I can't remember. This. <laughs> uh. we, we we have heard from previous guests that uh, playing against the British and Irish Lions is is incredibly special uh, for South Africans, and there's an atmosphere like no other. Almost whatever it is, 14 years on. Can you, though, take us through your memories of that yellow card against Luke Fitzgerald in the second test? Well, yeah, I was on the field for all of five seconds or six. It was a kickoff and it was the first ruck. Um, the build up to it is I was actually, I got injured the last game of Super Rugby and then I missed out on the first one in Durban. So I was stuck on 49 test matches and then got a start in the second test. I don't know, like, I mean, I'm a very laid back guy. Before, obviously, I was quite frenetic when I was playing. It was always the case. But you never really enter any game thinking, like, 
yes, sometimes you don't like a player and you're going like, listen, I'm going to give him a proper hard time today. But you never ever, ever go into any game thinking like you know, you've got an eye guard or something. So maybe it was just like the, like you say, like the the you know magnitude of this moment. You know, you don't get a chance to play against him twice unless you unless you're Mornay Stain. You know, in 1997, I remember watching at Newlands where you know we scored three tries and still lost the Test match at Newlands. Um, and then you get a chance in 2009 to you know show show your metal against them. So you're obviously up for it. And we all you know, like you in isolation. You sort of look at these games and you think, how the hell did you do it? But then when the Lions came here in 2019 and all the drama that unfolded with the Russies video and, you know, the physicality of the three test matches, you understand why some stuff like this happens? Because subconsciously there's so much media um, and, and it's such a big buildup. And the whole chat of the week was how brutal the British and Irish Lions are going to be physically because they felt that's the only part of the game where in Durban they really were behind in the first test match. So we were up for up for it, and then um, you, you you sort of you know wake up, get a yellow card after six seconds, and the next moment you know you you Vargo look for Gerald from the first ruck, which is you know it's just one of those things I guess you learn from, but it's definitely wasn't intentional. It's just something that sort of happened on the spur of the moment, and then you um, then you panic because you, we gave the Lions a head start because of me, and then you go on and you know fly around for seventy minutes trying to. To rescue or, or do you know, un, undo the damage that you've just done, I don't think I'm the most popular guy in Ireland. For sure, I'm not. But um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was nothing personal or no hard feelings. And it's also like one of those things you get wrong in life. You know, we make mistakes and you've got to learn from them. Um, and for me, it happened like slap bang in the middle of my career. So you know, it took a while. Not for me. Like I mean, we played them in November again. Uh, I scored a try in Croke Park. Um, and it just, I mean, I don't think the Aries know how to boo, but they were booing for the rest of the game whenever I touched the ball. So, um, but it was, it, it was uh, it, let's put it this way it wasn't my proudest moment. All right, Scott, final, it's what we like to call the quick fire rounds. First thing that comes into your mind, worst roommate? Scott Brits. Com- com- comfortably. I mean, he's the only child, so he just looks after himself. <laughs> <laughs> Down at the end. Best player you've ever played with? Uh, that's a she has a brutally tough one. Um, let's it's probably not the best, but probably one of the nicest to play with. Bucky's Best player you've ever played against? Uh, it's kind of hard to single out single out one, but it's like, Richie McCaw and George Smith. Loosest teammate you've ever played with? Um, loosest teammates after four beers, John de Villains. Biggest fight you've ever witnessed in training? Ooh, well, I was a youngster and uh, we had a guy called Lucas van Bullion and Farn Rotenbach. Now, both of them are enormous human beings and I was at the flank um, and we had this thing where I sort of slipped up and sort of got into the, the opposition props uh, ribs. And the next moment they were coming at me and I dodged a couple, tried to throw a couple and then they just got angry at each other. But I was slapping in the middle of heavyweight punches flying left, right and centre. Yeah, your prop has to look after you when you've done that. That's for him. Oh, oh no. Oh, no. And Sam, my, my prop took a beating you know, and I, I couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> All your fault. Yeah. Final few. Worst enemy in rugby? Oh, jeez. I mean, guys who got under my skin is whenever they any 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 blue bull I really played against as a stormer. Uh, Nick White. It's gotta be it's gotta be it's gotta be him. Um yeah I, w- I wasn't the biggest fan. Your single best moment on a rugby field. Oh geez I, I guess you you win a World Cup it's it's amazing. Um but also like the main thing is relief. Um but I, I guess the, the best moment didn't come there um, or the night after or the, the two weeks after. It's like when we arrived back in South Africa and we saw, we were, we were out at Tambo in Johannesburg and there was like 50,000 people just going absolutely nuts in tears, going berserk. You know, it was, it was the most humbling thing I've ever experienced. And uh, we were so privileged to be able to do something like that for the country. And finally, three players in the cab with you for the ultimate piss up. I've got to have John the Villiers. Um, and 
I've got to have Butch James because uh, it's because it's Butchy. And then I know we don't get this guy out often, um, but I'm definitely going to have Jock Free on there as well. Nice. Fabulous. Well, sadly, that is all the time we've got left for this week. Huge thank you to Ryan and to Freddie. And of course, a huge thanks to Scout. You've been brilliant. And we will see you all next week. Thank <laughs> you.